I think that I am on this panel to speak from a slightly different perspective, that is that of a facilitator, exhibition maker, and also member of the jury of the hybrid art category, which I had the chance to be part of for several times, so to have a kind of overview of tendencies. And I would like probably to pick one, and it's not coincidence maybe that the symposium also happens in this room with uh, Gilberto Esparza's piece just behind us, because there might be a kind of particular form of artwork that we have been witnessing that they are increasing incredibly in numbers. So we have, on the one hand, uh, art science projects that are unfolding, let's say, as data translation art, abstract, to very, very subversive, subversive hands-on appropriation. Um, and this is also a section that is quite dominant in the competition, and it's really represented in the increase in numbers in the competition itself. So, in this context of art-science relationships, I find it useful to complicate this alleged binary a bit, and I'm wondering, for example, why it is nearly always self-understood when referring to so-called art science paradigms that one meets the natural and the engineering science and not the social and the economic science, not the humanities, the Geisteswissenschaften in the literal sense of the term, and uh, which indeed include, for example, the philosophy of science and technology in the humanities. I'm also wondering why even in the media arts, where people often have a very large technical understanding and competence, the arts should even be the natural science others. Why should it be so? Right? It's coming from techni as well, art and techni. So there seems to coexist strong differences, of course, in methodology, strategy, and aesthetics for artists that choose to relate either to mathematics, informatics, robotics, to astronomy, physics, or to biology, and depending on the discipline, of course, the involvement that you find are extremely different. And I would therefore like to focus on an area which I'm personally uh, having more expertise in, which is the relationship to the biological science, especially in the case of those artists who appropriate biotechnologies as their material media. And we find they're very, very antagonistic um, motivations. Um, for example, um, it can be that they are primarily interested in staging literally authentic aliveness uh, with the recursive references to art history, with the long history of lifelike imitations and of appearances. So we know that in art, uh, by means of form, material, or process, a touch of aliveness has been staged involving the viewer visually and after painting, sculpture, automata, Art in the late 20th century has employed first dry informatics and robotics to stage aliveness, and then, since shortly, also wet cell and molecular biology. And second, we can also find in this section artists with hands-on practice of the line science who want to question the very cultural, biopolitical, epistemological underpinnings. And beyond illustration or visualization of scientific results, they interrogate these experimental systems that form hybrid epistemic things. Um, so I want to say that beyond theory and the researcher's own agency, then these epistemic objects are made up as well by the social structures of the lab, the material arrangements, or the model organisms, the instruments, in short, by the contemporary technologies and media. And it is at this latter level that art and science most often share things together, even if the motivations are different. So I want to argue maybe that these practices partake both of a performative turn in art and science, and also that what I have coined an epipist epistemological turn, when art itself is less concerned with formal aesthetic principles, but increasingly also with techno-scientific critique, alternative knowledge production, uh, focusing not only to aesthetically and conceptually uh, stage what we know, but how we know what we know. And by which the biotechnological media them, themselves become necessary to be read and analyzed, and that they become entirely part of the aesthetic object as such. 
So with this trend that we have of artistic research or research creation, like the Canadians call it, um, programs of artists in the labs, we also see an inflation of labs in the art spaces, of course, and setups that are intended not to conduct scientific experiments as such, but also to stretch the notion to the lab, of the lab to the degree of a, a very extreme pervasiveness. So Bruno Latour has argued that the lab has extended its world to the whole planet now, so much that within this world of hybrid causality, where natural and cultural forces cannot be distinguished anymore, um, that, of course, artists um, become perforce white codes who stage atmospheric uh, phenomena on the macro scale and biological systems on the micro scale. So however, and I want to slip to a slide here because I find this taxonomy quite interesting, um, you can do all in its country in a lab. And Oren Katz from Symbiotica has pointed to the weakness of the term of the lab. In an, an artist, even a life science lab, can have extremely different attitudes from the pure illustrator, a hands-on, an onlooker, appropriator, or somebody who's just ordering model organisms on the internet and reconceptualizes them. So what you do in artists in the labs, it's a whole different bargain, right? So to illustrate that, just some very short positions here. Here we have a very visual live tissue culture installation called Victimless Leather, by which Oren Katz and Jörg Zur effectively carry out hands-on co-culturing of human and animal cells over a polymer scaffold and to produce a miniature garment. But we have to ask, of course, is it really victimless, like the title says, and we only have to read the medium. Here also the medium is a message here, it's not the satellite, but it's a growth medium. And only if you know that the growth medium, in fact, contains fetal calf serum, you need to read the media to find out epistemologically that it's actually not victimless, because you have to have victims to make the media, right? Um, or in this example, let's say that we had a show with these artists uh, earlier this year in Berlin. Uh, for sterile, Revital Cohen and Thür van Baalen have asked Japanese biologists at Suro Yamaha to produce goldfish for them that are engineered to hatch without reproductive organs. For in addition of 45 to cope with the white cube talk. Um, in parallel, they constructed a machine that is reenacting the biologist's movements and actions, so to potentially automate the production of sterile goldfish, so to say, the, the outsourcing of reproduction. So which of Oren Katz's categories would this fall into? Right? Uh, what is involvement of the scientist and so on? Very different. Um, in Adam Brown's piece, not the one that is here, but it's very similar to that, Adam Brown's piece that he's uh, presenting here at the center here. In this installation, Origins of Life, we have the case of a poetic aesthetization of a known scientific experiment, of the Miller-Oray experiments, which is reenacted in manifold variations to try finding unpredictable, alternative, complementary results to those described in scientific literature. Uh, or here, former pop artist Billy Apple has produced an immortalized cell line out of his own uh, lymphocytes and be to become a resource for art and science, both, and at the same time granting himself as an artist cellular immortality. Right? In the case of Paul Venus, these live biotech installations that you probably know, especially the latent figure protocol, he destabilizes the idea that we have from the so-called genetic fingerprint. So from the mindset of a politically motivated media tactical artist, he deconstructs the very notion of what a DNA fingerprint might be, which precisely is not an imprint, it's a trace of the body by which has been manipulated through lab processes and which doesn't need to come from the finger at all. So here he's producing figurative images from a known DNA sample instead of an abstract pattern from an unknown DNA sample. So he can construct a motif such as ID, the copyright symbol, crescent stars, uh, cross bones, and so on. And by teaching each lane of the gel as a row of pixel composed by DNA fragments. So hence materializing also the eternal chicken and egg question in how far scientific results are determined by the technical models of production and representation.
So Vanus, in fact, is doing applied STS. He makes transparent um, and sets all the biotechnological and hum non-human agency in place. So I just wanted to conclude with this example because it's a good example also for this kind of misunderstanding. Um, I do, I'm not sure that there's a dichotomy between art and science, and I'm reluctant to think of these manifold practices simple as art-science overlappings. Indeed, um, in the vein of P.C. Snow supposedly split two cultures, there seem to be residues in such a binary split in research cultures between the humanities and the natural science, such as very well illustrated by the 99th uh, scandal of the so-called Sokal affair. Remember that at this time the two physici physicists, uh, Sokal and Brigmont, accused postmodern philosophers of abuse of science and its technical terms, just producing vague, fashionable nonsense, imposture intellectuel, meant to unmask philosophers such as Virilio, Lacan, Christeva, Latour, Baudrillard, Deleuze, Gattari, and the alleged superficial erudition when using concepts beyond their competence, such as entropy, Gödel's uh, incomplete list theorem, quantum physics, and so on. But we also have to remember, and this is interesting, that in the following bitter debates, the French philosophers and sociologists of science shot back and claimed this conceptual freedom to appropriate and blamed the authors of the pamphlet themselves for not paying attention to the fluidity of shifting metaphors that are often also used literally and uncritically by the natural scientists themselves. So as a conclusion, I would say that beyond visualization, sonification, data translation, these kind of works also have to be analyzed precisely on the basis of the shared artistic and scientific media themselves with their respective epistemic nexuses. So my own curatorial preference then also as a practitioner includes what I call the price for fruitful misunderstanding that is grounded in the different uses, the different methodologies, motivations, despite the very shared media. So hopefully we can discuss that a bit. Thank you. Okay.